around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford. As always, we'd like to welcome you today to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministry. We thank you for allowing us to come into your home this Monday and to share with you the unsearchable riches of Christ our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. I hope to see many of you uh, this coming weekend in Branson. Uh, We're believing God for a move and a freshet and a flood, a deluge of the Holy Spirit of God here in these last days. The reason we believe that emphatically is because the Bible says in Acts 2.17, And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons, your daughters, they're going to prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men, they shall have visions. And on my handmaidens and on my servants will I pour out in those days of my spirit. Jesus said God is a spirit in John 4, 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We have tremendously limited understanding in God, but he's real, his power is real, his word is real, everything about God is real. Man is encumbered by his fleshly tabernacle, and it's hard for man to grasp and fathom the greatness, the deity, and the majesty of God Almighty. Before we get into the program today, I do want to encourage you uh, to come and be with us. Uh, If you haven't gotten your tickets, I pray that you'll make contact with Steve Quill, Gen 6 Productions, and get online. You can watch the live programming on line if you cannot come to Branson. Uh, Again, as I said, we're believing God for a a move of the Holy Spirit to touch people's hearts and lives. Because without a doubt, we are living in the last days, and I, I just feel in my heart we are encroaching a very uncertain time. We're getting closer and closer to a very, very uncertain time. And and I'm afraid of what's going to happen. I saw just the other day where the government has taken in $1.3 trillion in taxes, and yet we are still deficit spending. A thousand million dollars makes one billion. A thousand million makes one billion. A trillion is a thousand billion dollars. So think of the enormity when the government is extrapolating, taking away from the people 1.3 trillion. That's a thousand billion dollars. Think of that. And yet we still deficit spend. What a grave and a great tragedy. Those of you who may be listening to us or watching us on YouTube with our new format, you will not be getting the music on these videos because of copyright purposes. Those of you on Block Talk Radio will be getting them because it's just the audio portion. So if that's why there's a little bit difference there in the timing of the one program versus the video. Having a lot of positive comments about the video lets people see just exactly what we do here in the studio. I'm here in my office having just a soundboard and uh, a couple CD machines and an amplifier and a microphone uh, to do what I do in here. And Stephen takes care of all the other work on the other side and the larger studio where we do our, our literal videoing and audio there in the big studio. So we have just a small setup here in this studio, my, my pastor's office, where we work 
and do the programming from this smaller area. We've been teaching on being subject to rebellion, subject to rebellion. And uh, by the way, we got tremendous, tremendous comments, uh, and 99.9% were positive on the Godhead. Uh, I, I taught that a desirous for you to see a little deeper into the scriptures and come to your own decision, your own conclusion. As I said, Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, make it very clear. We know there's someone on the throne, but we never see that person, but we know who it is. <clears throat> it is without a doubt the Father. And Jesus comes and takes the book out of his hand that's set on the throne. We always are able to see Jesus, but we have never, from my research, researching the scriptures, have seen the manifestation of the Father in a, in a physical form, a similitude, an image of what we would call like a man. It's always lightning, thunder, voice, trumpet, sounds, fire. Uh, that's always the manifestation. But when we see God, in the Old Testament, it was a pre-incarnate Christ, and then he became carnate in the New Testament. So I hope you were able to glean a plethora of information from that series. Again, we started this new series. This is part seven today, part seven on September the 10th, 2018, Monday. We're going to pick up in verse 16, and we're going to do a very in-depth study here because I want to show you something. I want to teach you something here that you may not be aware of or may not know or have ever put together when studying the Scriptures. So this is why this series here or this program today will be somewhat lengthy, <clears throat> and we're going to go back to the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 16, and try to exegete what happened in the rebellion with Korah. Psalms 106, beginning at verse 16 they envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron the saint of the Lord. The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. Now I want to take you back to the book of Numbers. We're going to look at just exactly what happened in this rebellion against God and against God's anointed. Moses was the lawgiver. Aaron was the high priest. His son Eleazar would, would take over the priesthood after his demise, after his death, when God told Moses, and that's the, one of the saddest stories you'll ever read in the scriptures, when God told Moses, bring Aaron and Eleazar up to the mountain, he stripped Aaron of his garment his garment, his priestly garment, he died and then told Moses, take the priestly garment now and put that attire on Eleazar. And when they came back without Aaron, the, 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 the people mourned profusely, even greater so when God took Moses up and he died and God buried him. It is amazing to watch the unadulterated judgment of God when dealing with men. Here, God graciously becomes the undertaker for both Aaron and Moses. He buries them, but sin deprived them of the ability to go into the promised land. Now let's look at Numbers chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Elib, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. 
And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly famous and the congregation men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. Just like in the days of Moses, there are those who rise up and attack those who God has ordained and God has rightfully anointed. God picks and chooses for the ministry. I had absolutely nothing to do concerning the call of God on my life. I never asked God, call me. I never told God what to do. When God calls a man, that is the most august and greatest calling that a man could ever possess. When God says, I'm calling you out for my service. God called ministers are never elected. There's not a consensus and a vote that goes out to the purported constituency and says, we're going to take a vote. Who wants Pastor Lankford or David Lankford to be a minister? Who chooses to vote in the affirmation? God doesn't do that. God chooses whom he wills. Joseph was a little brother. Why didn't God call Reuben? Why didn't God call Levi? Why didn't God call Benjamin? There were 12 sons. But see, God made that calling himself. God made that divine appointment himself. And I'm amazed. And, and I will say this. I will say this unashamedly. I say this with no reservation. There are those out there who think they're called and they want to be called, but God never called them. Most truly God-called men run from God. They don't want to be in ministry. Why? Because it's the nature of man, even in the calling of God, being subject to rebellion. God, I don't want to be a preacher. I, I, I was called to preach when I was 12. I did not want to be a minister. I ran from that calling till I was 23 years of age. I ran as hard as I could run. That's why I got so deep into sin. I was trying to drown out that calling. I tried to uh, uh, sedate myself, if I can use that term, emotionally and mentally, trying to drown out the conviction, the calling of God upon my life. Men run from the call of God. Read the scriptures. Read the scriptures. Many times men ran from God. They didn't want to be used of God. They didn't want God's touch on their life. Why? Because when God calls you, God separates you from the rest of the people. That's what God did with Moses and Aaron. And, of course, Korah said, hey, guys, you're not the only one around here that God speaks to. Hey, we're holy. We live right. We live right. Notice what the scripture says there in verse 3, Numbers 16 and 3. And they gathered together against Moses and against Aaron. They were against them. I have all sorts of people against me. It doesn't matter to me. You're fighting a losing battle. When God is for someone, God has called someone, God has anointed someone, you're fighting a losing battle. You're wasting your time. You're wasting energy. You say, well, I don't, I don't like Pastor Langford. That's fine. Don't listen to Pastor Langford. I don't like so-and-so. Don't listen to them. Don't listen for hours and then turn around and critique them and find fault like Cora. But you see, they're only hurting themselves because Moses did not petition God and say, hey, God, 
would you call me into the ministry? No, his mother and father recognized he was a proper child. In other words, there was something unique about him. So they put him in the ark and they put him in the bulrushes knowing that uh, Pharaoh's daughter would find him. And when she unclothed him or unwrapped the garment around him, she looked at him. She said, this is a Hebrew child. How would she know that? Because he was circumcised. Miriam was sitting there, perched, ready to do what she asked her to do. That's why Jehokabed sent Miriam and said, watch what they do. So when Pharaoh's daughter saw the child, she said to Miriam as a servant, go get me someone to nurse this baby. Well, who do you think Miriam went and got? Miriam went and got his mama, and she was paid to nurse the man of God, the child of God. God's election. So let's drop down now to Numbers chapter 16, verse 23, and let's let's see what happens in the discourse when they gathered themselves together against, I want, I want to emphasize that they were against Moses, they were against Aaron. What had Moses and Aaron done to them? Can anybody tell me what Aaron and Moses had done to Israel? Nothing. That's right. They had done absolutely nothing, but yet they were against them. You see that spirit in America today. What has Donald Trump done to individuals? Nothing. But they're against him. They don't even know why they're against him. This is God's way uh, of separating the sheep from the goats. People. When you see people that are professing Christians aligning themselves with the world and the hatred of the world, you know they're not true Christians. They are children of Satan. They are of their father, the devil. Those who claim to be Christians and castigating what God is doing. Remember, remember the verse says, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. They were against what God had ordained and what God had anointed, what God had chosen, what God had predestined, what God had predetermined. These, this crowd, this, this, this rebellious crowd was against what God had chosen, what God had ordained, what God had established. They were against it. Can I tell you, when you are against what God has separated, what God has anointed, what God has appointed, and you come against it, you're not coming against the man. You're coming against God. The men just happen to be somewhat the pawns, the mediators, the go-between between mankind and God. And so they get attacked. They get attacked. Number 16, beginning at verse 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation. Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Now, Moses says, get you up from these three men. Some of you need to get away from some of the people you're listening to. You need to get away from those who are vile, wicked, and corrupt, but yet they say, I'm a Christian. You need to get away from those who are uh, have a spirit of usurpation. They are usurping things from your life. They usurp your peace. They usurp your comfort. They usurp your joy. Uh, they usurp your strength. When anytime you usurp anything, you're taking it without having the right to take it. When somebody is under a spirit of usurpation. They're taking from you unjustly. God has not ordained it. God has not allowed it. But you are the one permitting it. You're, you're the one allowing it. You have to stop it yourself. So God said to Moses, speak unto this motley crowd. Verse 25, and Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and to Byram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men. We know these are wicked men because the Bible says they're wicked men. 
There's no doubt about their wickedness because the word of God decrees. The word of God declares these are wicked men. Wicked men. There are those out there who profess to be preachers and teachers and this and that. They're wicked men. They're wicked men. Remember, they see themselves one way. God sees them another way. Korah, Dothan, Abiram saw themselves one way. And because they lifted themselves up in pride against what God had ordained, what God had established, they came against Moses and they came against Aaron and they castigated these men. That's right. They castigated these men saying, oh, you, you take too much upon you. This whole congregation is holy. Everyone in this congregation is holy, Moses. Every one of them. And the Lord when Korah says the Lord is among them, he's saying the same thing that God had done with Moses. God was with Moses. Korah says God's with this crowd. Wherefore, lift up yourselves above the congregation. Why, why do you think you're above the congregation, Moses? The fact is he was. The fact is, Moses was above the congregation. He was anointed. Aaron was anointed. God made Aaron a high priest. These others, working under the leadership of Aaron, were mere priests. Mo uh, Aaron was the high priest. This was the first high priest and the priestly order. And everyone underneath Aaron were subject to him and the priesthood. So let's go back here, number 16 and 25. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. Sins. You'll be consumed because of their sins. Now listen, Korah. Dathan, Abiram were sinners. They were wicked men. The Bible says they were wicked. They were consumed with sin. And God gives a warning of judgment before he executes judgment. You better get away from these men because you are going to be consumed because of their sins. Verse 27. So they gathered from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side, and Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives and their sons and their little children. Little children are about to get killed because of the wicked sins that were in the hearts of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Little children. Number 16 and 28. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own hand. Moses took no attribution. Moses took no credit. Moses did not point to himself. He gave the glory to God. He said, Every work that you have witnessed, I have not done them of mine own mind, but rather what I have done, I did under the anointing and power of the Spirit of God. I didn't do it in my own will. I didn't do it in my own flesh. I didn't do it in my own works. Verse 29, if these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. What was he saying here? If the men die the common death. In other words, if they live to be 80, 85, 90, and they die, you'll know that God's not with me. Oh, but if they die, if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. See, Moses knew God was about to execute judgment. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, 
then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground cleaved asunder that was under them. Cleaved means cleavage, a split, a split in the ground. And the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. There are those out there who do not believe in a literal hell. Or if there is one, you go there if you're a sinner and you just abide there uh, a few years. And once you have all the sin burned out, you get a free out of jail card, you go to heaven. That's not true. From the time that Moses penned these words and the time that Jude in verse 11 alluded to these men, it's been nearly 2,000 years. This was written about 17, 1800 years before Christ. These men, these men were absolute rebels. They were prone to rebellion. They were prone to rebellion. They were subject to to rebellion. They demonstrated the rebellion in their hearts and their mind and their spirit. They are what the Bible describes in the book of Jude as gain saying. Gain saying. That's that's nothing but somebody who's leading a a uh, a rebellion, a public rebellion against someone or something, and they're making a lot of verbal comments. Now, Jude 11 says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Now, from the time Korah went to hell... And Jude wrote this, Jude verse 11, we have approximately 17, 1800 years. Now it's 2018. So these, this Korah and his crowd have been in hell now for nearly 4,000 years. So this idiocy that men get out after a two year, three year, four year period is not true. These men had already been in hell for, like I said, somewhere between 16 and 1800 years when Jude wrote this epistle. He doesn't tell us these men are out. He warns us, woe unto them that have gone in the way, who, who act like Cain, Balaam, and Korah. So, those who preach the heresy, there is no eternal hell, no eternal punishment. Why does Jude then tell us these men, we're being warned about these men, their lifestyle, their behavior, their disposition. Cain was a murderer. Cain was a murderer. Cain was religious. Balaam, he sought money. When Balak asked him to curse Israel, and then Korah perished in his gain saying. His gain saying. If if there is truth that men get out of hell after three or four years, why does uh, Jude not tell us that they're out? Because they're not out. They're not out. They're still in hell. And they'll stay there even after Christ returns for another thousand years. After Christ returns, after Christ returns, 
and the millennial kingdom is established in the earth, it'll be at the end of that thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. When these men will be raised from the dead, stand at the white great the great white throne judgment, great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20, they will be judged, they will be found guilty, their names will not be in the book of life, then, then they'll be sentenced to the second death. They'll die a second time and be cast into the lake of fire with the devil, the antichrist, the false prophet, death and hell will also be cast into that lake of fire and these people will be cast eternally in the lake of fire. I never fail to be amazed at the asininity how people will twist the scriptures to their own destruction and their own damnation. Gainsaying means to speak out in being against of or in dispute of. Korah, Dathan, Abiram were in total opposition. I just shared with you there in Numbers chapter 16, they were against Aaron. They were against Moses. They were against God's anointed. But you couldn't get them to see that. Let me show you something here in Psalms 106, verse 17. The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram, whose name is missing. Whose name is missing? Korah. I thought we just read where Korah went to hell alive. Yes, we did. Why then... Is Korah not mentioned here? I'll tell you why. God judged Korah, but God did not judge Korah's sons. He did not judge Korah's sons. He didn't cut Korah off like he did Eli and his sons Hophni and Phinehas. Remember God told Samuel as a little child, I'm going to cut Eli's arm off. That is a symbolic spiritual application. There would never be another seed out of Eli's loins that would be in the priesthood. I, I, I shared with you here in Numbers 16. Korah, verse 1, Numbers 16 and 1. These are just little things that help you to understand the Bible. Uh, most teachers won't get this deep and expound on some of these things, but I, I want to help your understanding what's going on here. Numbers 16, verse 1, Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi. Korah was of the tribe of Levi. Where did all the priests come from? Levi. So God judged the priesthood when he judged Korah. But he didn't judge Korah's sons. How do we know that? Now we look at Numbers chapter uh, Numbers chapter 26. Uh, let's look at, um, let's start at verse 8. Numbers 26 verse 8. And the sons of Paul, you, Elib, the sons of Elib, Nemuel, and Dathan, and Abiram, that is that Dathan and Abiram, which were famous in the congregation, who strove against Moses, against Aaron, in the company of Korah, and they strove against the Lord. That was my earlier point. When you strive against God's men, God's truly called anointed men, you're striving against God. What foolishness. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah. When that company died, what time the fire devoured 250 men and they became a sign, notwithstanding the children of Korah died not. God did not punish Korah's sons. God did not punish 
Korah's sons. That's why here in Psalms 106, in verse 17, the earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. The reason he didn't mention Korah there was because he didn't judge and execute Korah's sons. What a merciful God. What a merciful God. Psalms 106, 17. The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. See, these men were in absolute rebellion. They were speaking out in and against God's anointed. They were fighting God's plan. They were fighting God's will. They were fighting God's purpose. Don't do that, folks. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Now, I'm going to say this. All of us are prone to rebellion, and sometimes we even have trouble humbling ourselves. That's why you've heard me preach throughout the scriptures. We are told, humble yourself, humble yourself, humble yourself. You got to humble yourself. Let's look at the priesthood and, and, and what it says in Exodus 28, verses 1 through 3. This is God's commandment to Moses and how he's going to prepare garments, etc., etc., for the tabernacle. I won't get into all of it, but I want you to see this. Exodus 28, verses 1 through 3. And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel. In other words, he's sanctifying, he's setting them apart to be saints. That he may minister unto me in the priest office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. Let's pause there for a minute. Do you recognize any other men there that were killed? Let's look at this verse again. And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel that he may minister unto me in the priest office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. Thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. Thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And he goes on down from there, and he describes the garments that were made for Aaron. But there are two men we know are going to get killed of Aaron's loins, Nadab and Abihu. Why would God kill them? Because they brought strange fire into the holy place. You can't do ungodliness and get by with it. What a great and grave tragedy. People sometimes don't understand how tenuous their relationship is with God. Why is it tenuous? It is tenuous because they are disobedient. Did you know Aaron was the older brother of Moses? When they began this journey, when they began this pilgrimage, Moses was 80 years old. Aaron was 84 years old. How do we know that? Exodus chapter 7, verse 7. And Moses was fourscore years old, and Aaron fourscore and three years old when they spake unto Pharaoh. So Moses was 80. Aaron was 83 years old. Aaron was the older brother. But who's, who had the greater calling? Now that to me is a toss-up. I know Moses is lauded for being the lawgiver, but remember, Aaron was the one that could go into the Holy of Holies and minister unto the Lord. It is a, it is a privilege. I know it is a privilege for me to be called of God as a man. I, I realize I have been privileged by God 
to be called into the ministry. I have been privileged to be personally anointed of the Holy Ghost. And because to whom much is given, much is required. I, I, I can say this with a clean hands and a pure heart. I never wanted to be a preacher. I, I did not desire this. I did not want this. Can I tell you something as a God-called, ordained uh, minister of God? You never get away from the ministry. I, I don't care if I'm at home or I'm out in the yard working or whatever I'm doing. I, I'm always aware. I'm always so God-conscious of the calling up on, that's on my life. You know, I, I, I have to be guarded. I have to be reserved at times. I can't be flippant. I, I can't cut up too much. You say, well, well, God's not that hard. No, he's not that hard. But I understand the sacredness, the sacredness of God's touch. True people who understand the calling of God understand that that person, by no decision, by no choice of their own, they are automatically made different because God touched them for a purpose. I have never understood in my mind, now I know my understanding is terribly profusely limited. I have never understood why men wanted to be something that God did not call them to be. Remember Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, the gifts and the calling of God are not without repentance. Once God calls you, you're called. He, God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't say, let's make a deal. You can do your secular work and you can do my work. I quit secular work to go into the ministry. I preach the gospel. I live by the gospel. I preach this gospel, I live by this gospel. I trust God to supply all of my needs. You, you will not hear this minister ask for money. Now, that's, that's a little bit different than most ministers, isn't it? That's a little bit different than most ministries. Well, it's different than probably 99.9999999999. Why don't you ask for money, Pastor? Don't have to. God supplies the need. Every time we have a need, and this is the God's truth. I, I, I'm not exaggerating. I'm certainly not boasting. But someone from the United Kingdom just the other day gave us an infusion of money. The man said, I heard the audible voice of God said, give the ministry this. You see, I try to walk in integrity. I try to keep my word. I'm a human being. I, I purposely work to not ever tell a lie or, or say something that I cannot honor and keep as my word. My point is, when you serve the God that we claim we serve, he said, I will supply all of your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. I know we get the letters. We get the little notes. People say, it's such a refreshing thing to hear a preacher preach, and, it, and, it, and at the end of the program, he doesn't say, send me money. Send me an offering. We don't do that. We don't have to do that. See, that's the confusing part for me and people who say, God, call me to do this and this and this and this. And then yet God does not supply the need. But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 19. God is the one that supplies. God's the one that not only supplies, God is the one that provides. And yet Ministers will quote Luke 6, 38, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosoms. They preach that to you, yet they turn around on the flip side, and they're begging for money. I have convictions. One of my convictions is not asking for money. 
You see, my God is a big God. My God owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. If we're ministering to you, blessing you, you're learning, growing, you choose whether to bless us or not, to be a blessing to the ministry. I have people who will email me and say, I've been listening to you for years. They've never supported us, not one penny. Oh, but they love to get fed. They love to be ministered to. They love to hear these biblical truths. And I, I spend a lot of time searching the scriptures. I believe it was last Saturday I spent five and a half or six hours, just Saturday alone, in my Bible, turning, looking, searching, seeking. Why? I want to know more about God's word. I want to know more about my Lord. What a, what, a, what a great, 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 great big God you and I serve. We're not to live a life of anxiety, a life of fear, a life of trepidation. Romans 8, 31, Paul said, if God be for us, who can be against us? 1 John 4, 4 says, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 5 and 14, whatsoever, excuse me, 1 John 5 and 4, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. The other verse I quoted there or added and was quoting wrong was 1 John 5 and 14. This is the confidence that we have. If we ask anything according to his will, we know he heareth us. God is a big God. God can supply all of your need. God made provision. Did you know God even went to the, 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 the degree of providing, the degree of provision that he gifted men to make Aaron's garments. He gifted men to carve out these great, great temple Implements, the menorah, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, when I say menorah, the seven golden candlestick, the altar of incense, the brazen altar, the table of showbread, the curtain, the tapestry. Then they not only would carve all that out from mostly shittim wood, they would then gold plate it. It was so ornate, it was so beautiful. See, the things in heaven are not opulent to, to be opulent in the sense of covetousness and greed. It, it, it's Heaven is such a grand place. The grandeur of heaven cannot be fathomed by mortal men. And everything there is so awesome, it is innate with men to want to worship God. Everything worships God. Henry Gruber, you need to listen to his testimony on going to heaven, how the flowers, how everything is praising God because there's no hindrances there. Satan led a rebellion. Satan tried to hinder God. God kicked him out. Away with you, Lucifer. Your name now is no longer Lucifer. It's Diablo. That's Greek for the devil, Diablo. Cast him out. Cast him away. Throw him away. See, that was Lucifer's choice. He made a bad choice. He made a, a terrible choice. But again, it was his choice. God didn't make that choice for him. He made it for himself. Making choices, let me say this in closing today, Making choices assure consequences. Let me say that again. If you're watching me today, making choices assures consequences. Remember that. You make a bad choice, you're going to have bad consequences. In other words, you're going to have bad results. 
Don't play with God. Don't tempt God like Korah did. Oh, we're, we're a holy faction. Aaron, the saint of the Lord. Why was he called a saint? Because he was separated unto God. Are you separated unto God? 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 says, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Did you know you're called to be a saint too, just like Aaron was? Now, whether you conform to the calling of a saint, now that's another story. That's another story. That is your choice. Will you conform to what God has called you to be? You see, I'm, I'm here to help you to grow in grace and in knowledge. I know I say things sometimes that may be offensive. Jesus said things that offended people. But that's part of growing. That is part of maturing. It's constructive leadership. I started to say criticism. There's no criticism in God. There's no condemnation in God. But there is the reproof. There is the rebuke. There is the exhortation that tries to move a person in the right direction. People who love God don't mind being reproved. Moses tried to reprove Korah, Dothan, and Abiram. They wouldn't have it. They rose up. They said, hey, buddy, Moses, you're not the only one that God speaks to. Again, Moses had nothing to do with God calling him from a little baby. A little baby. A little child that his mother, his dad, Aram, who saw he was a proper child. He was, he was different. There was an anointing. There was a calling on his life. So they didn't suffer him. See, Pharaoh was wanting to kill all the, the Israeli babies. And the midwives who were Egyptians said, these women never need help. They're, they're so strong. They birth their children. Their labor is, is so little, so small. See, God was accelerating the birthing of a nation, the growing of a nation. He was accelerating the growth of the nation. And the women didn't go through the same adversity in childbearing. See, that's that favor. That's that touch. That's that touch of God on their lives. Knowingly, maybe some did. Unknowingly, many didn't know. But God mitigated, God lessened their favor so they didn't have to have midwives to help them in childbirth. We look to see you here Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Please pray for us that the Holy Ghost will anoint us, that God will use us to speak the Word of God this coming Sunday morning. I look to see you there. Hug your neck, shake your hand. Pray for us. And I pray that God will give you safe travel to and from Branson. We're looking for a great, great time in the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Have a great evening. God willing, I'll see you tomorrow at this same time. We're again be preaching on subject to rebellion. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.